Now we're at episode 6 of Quantum Bible. And this is so tremendous of a phrase that I don't know if I'm going to be able to cover all the things I need to say about it properly, but I'm going to try. Greek means and, of course, now our boy Antitemus is the new Kai. It's April 12th that he's crowned. So if John is using um, uh, in his uh, Jewish sacred year accounting, this would be the next year. Okay? And about to go down into the abyss. Now the abyss is a whole doctrine in itself. You see it earlier in Revelation when it's talking about it in Revelation 9. And there's a lot of debate about exactly what it means. But considering what Revelation 9 says, a lot of that debate doesn't need to really be there. Literal demons. 200 million of them. Demons, not humans. So it's not a human army, it's a demon army come up out of the abyss. Now the abyss, the, the problem is where is this abyss? Underneath the Tigris and Euphrates apparently. Okay. And a lot of the debate theologians have had about it is well are those the Genesis 6 demons who change their, those, you know their bodies are made of light so they can change themselves into matter. Um, that who turned themselves as it were in the human form and copulated with the humans such that there were only six pure humans left okay eight actually um, is that where the abyss is and were they jailed there because of that because we know angels were jailed there that's in Peter but it's not clear whether abyss is the same place okay well it's a prison of some kind somewhere deep underneath the earth Okay, that's the most important thing to know about it. And I say deep underneath the earth because abusas is also used for depths of water. Okay, so somewhere way underneath the earth. And, you know, how could angels be chained there? I don't know. But we do know that a black hole chains light. I mean, you know, we could spend years just speculating on what that means. But I need to stick to current history, current as it is in the time of this verse. The point is, is that it's, by using the term abyss, which goes all the way back to um, Old Testament, but it's a Greek word for it. By using the word abyss, the idea is a prison for real, the most bad, okay? And of course, this term will come up again, you know, at the second advent and at the end of history when... Um, the millennium completes, the books are open, and the devil and his angels, you know, are cast again into prison. But this time it's, it's an abyss that becomes a, a nuclear fission or fusion for a new universe. But see, that, that all of what I just said would take like a whole year to explain where you find it in Bible, how do you know that that's reasonably true in Bible, blah, 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 blah. So ask God for the verses and the concepts if you feel like you need to cover this. The basic idea here is that it is a metaphor of prison. It is also quite literal because the Revelation says this is going to actually happen to the actual beast that's there during the tribulation at the end. So what he's doing here is he's setting up a, an analogy, a paradigm. Again, that's what Revelation 17 does. It is at once a paradigm for world trends now. Because Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. So what is his plan? Well, you're looking at it. And at the same time, it's telling you about actual attempts in the past. Because you know that through the meter, what years are being stressed. And it's also telling you, hi, in the future, this pattern that is now much more clear in your mind as a result of seeing what past it relates to, it's going to happen again. And not just once. It's going to keep on happening as a trend of history. Now, the next thing I need to say about this, and I'm still talking about the principles here rather than the particular history that's being covered in this juncture. 
one of the things that's really hard for a student to understand, and I made a video on it, is the idea that Rome will revive. Of course, the question is, which Rome? And everybody's thinking, Italy. Well, no. And that's why they keep on drooling over seven heads and ten horns. It's the idea of a dominant world power. And its dominance is glorified. And that's going on right now. In Russia. And in the U.S. Putin's supposed to be worth something like $200 billion per a broder. He did a test, just did his testify, just testified about the Magnitsky Act. And uh, Magnitsky was a friend of his who was tortured to death in Russian prison. And through that, he learned all these bad things about Putin. So he's the guy that I'm getting the $200 billion from. And it's now 7 2017, and I believe his testimony was today. But the remarks were released yesterday, and I read them yesterday. All right? So this idea of a dominating Rome coming back into power that was, but is not, at the time of writing and even now, and is about to, once it rises, see, he doesn't have to say it will rise again. By saying this, it's about to go down to destruction. Okay? And I think Anabino also has a connotation of embarking. This is disembarking. But it might be a concept of embarking. Let me look it up. Revelation 17, 8. Come up. Yeah. Embarking. See? To embark. But it also has a connotation of disembark. So the thing that's so ironic about this particular phrase is that they're embarking onto the world in order to go down. Okay? to destruction. Now, I forget what the word for... I think katabino is what's da going down. The opposite of katabino. But he's using anabino because it's not alive yet. It's going to come up to the world and then go down. Usually BDAG has something about antonyms. See? Making an ascent. Because it is not, so it's got to make an ascent. But he's, he's sort of like concatenating the whole thing by saying, yeah, it's going to make an ascent from the abyss. That's, that's literal for Revelation 9. But it's also figurative because it's going to go down later to destruction. Abusas is a down movement. It's down. And of course, the fact that it's going to go to destruction is, is right here. Which I got to get to in another increment because I still got to cover this one. So the point you're supposed to get from this is that, oh, you know, we saw up here everybody's wondering at the beast that's Christians versus Christians, and they're all just standing there and looking at it. Oh, I don't believe this, and they look at it again. Oh, I don't believe this, and they look at it again. Some of them are saying that because they're really glad of the persecution of Christians by Christians, and some are really shocked about it. How can it be possible that Christians would persecute Christians? All right, so there ends up being that's what the beast was. See, was prior to this clause, and people are in wonder and amazement at it, positive and negative. So, there is an urge for it to come back. So, it's about to rise from the abyss. But implicit in that, because Abyss is low, and that's where they were, because it's the demon army, literal, in Revelation 9. Sorry, you can believe in demons or not, but that's what the text says. Alright, it's about to go up in order to what? Go down. Because it's coming from down. It shouldn't have gone up. But Satan lobbied God for the key in Revelation 9. And then his pal Apollyon, a.k.a. Abaddon, and all this 200 million demons come up with him. Alright? And he is about to go into, you know, be led away into destruction. In other words, because they come up, they're going to go down. So when I'm talking about something that's going into destruction, something that rises in order to die, that's what's going on here. And why is that rising occur? It's occurring because everybody's all wondering at the beast. 
which we'll get more of by the end of this verse, by the end of verse 8, explaining that. Now, what's hardest to grasp as I started to say, is why would everybody wonder after this beast? Why would anybody, Christian or non-Christian, be thrilled by the idea of the blood of the saints being, you know, Christians going against Christians, Christian civil war? Why would that thrill anybody? I can see why it would horrify a person enough to just keep looking at it. But where he's, where the, this anaphoric center is going to end is basically saying everybody wants it. And, you know, when I heard this in Bible class, because my pastor executed Revelation verse by verse for four freaking years, seven times a week at 90-minute classes, I, w I hated all this. I'm going to tell you right now. I hate prophecy. I hated it then. I hate it now. And I got punished for it. I don't hate it so much now. What I wanted then and what I wanted now was to know God better. Okay, well, we, you just saw in the last two increments how this does help you know God better. But like many intellectuals, and unfortunately I was born with a high IQ, so that forces me to be one, which is worthless, actually. Um, I didn't want to accept this emotional drooling over the rapture and prophecy and all that. To me, the only stupid people do that. Well, obviously I'm wrong. And to heighten the proof that this is what people are going to do and they keep trying to do throughout history, tying to this very verse, and the guy who wrote the book didn't mean to do that, is Dr. Theodore's decline of the myth of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And his big stress in his book, which I did a video on and urge anybody who's willing to buy it, buy it. And you should be willing to buy it if you're in Bible study. Is that people keep wondering after the beast. They keep watching the beast and just shock and awe and they just stand there and watch and watch and watch and watch. So now that the beast is gone, they want it back. So it's going to come back out of the abyss. See, this is all fitting together. And the guy's book, which has nothing to do with this, as far as I can tell, although he admits that the preoccupation with reviving Rome is theological in nature. Yeah, here's why. But his big point is, hi, the scholars, mostly pagan, or at least not, they have no love for the Bible, they're all hung up on and praising the old Rome that died. So what would happen if someone starts it up again? They're going to praise that. You see the point? So it's about to come up out of the abyss is actually a historical trend. And we're going to see here how that historical trend plays. Because this was like the first instance of a fall. The fall of Rome is the focus of this phrase. The fall of it. And yet the word anabino is used to come up. Okay? Literally to ascend. Satan said, I will be like the most high. Isaiah 14. Ha ha. Okay? Um, so again, think of this as prison. And this is going up, but it's really going down. You think you're rising, but you're just, get, you're just getting prepared for a fall. It is about to. Hasn't happened yet. It's about to. In other words, it's the next event. When, mellow. Mellow means something that's about to be. It isn't now, but it's like imminent. Imminent could be years away, but it's the next big thing to happen. All right. So now I've sort of introduced you to theological concepts behind this. And the big point to know is that the fall of Rome is a big drool factor with the scholars of Roman history, with pretty much everybody. And the book that Dr. Theodore wrote was trying to figure out why. First of all, was it really a decline? Was it really a fall? And why is everybody in love with it? And basically what he ends up showing you is that everybody is in love with Rome the way the way Gibbon was. Gibbon who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Ever since him, in 1776 is when he wrote it, 
everybody's been in love with with the whole story and fascinated Dalmatia with Rome. So if you keep on being fascinated with something, there's going to be an urge to recreate it. So therefore, coming up out of the abyss, out of the prison of the past. Coming up again, but it's gonna it's coming up only so that it's gonna die again. All right. And why is that so apt a phrase? Inc just incredibly apt a phrase for this time period. Well, when Valentini died in 455, there was no successor. The closest successors that could have been were the, his daughters who were married to Gothic princes. Basically what happens during this period is an interregnum from 455 to 467 when Antemus, Antemus is made emperor of Western Rome by the guy who replaces Martian. That's Martian. His successor is Leo I. Now, Leo is related to Antithemius because Leo's daughter is married to Antithemius' son. At the same time, Antithemius is married to the daughter of Martian. Martian had kids before he married Polcaria. So, Antithemius is, as it were, part of the family. And he is finally, they, they have to do a lot of fighting with the Goths during this 12 year increment. At the end of it, Antithemius comes up, as it were, ascends to emperorship of Western Rome. You starting to get the hint here? And it's about to come up out of the abyss. Out of what? The prison of Byzantine unity of church and state, which Marcion did a lot to encourage and solidify by the Council of Chalcedon. Okay. Leo ends up being the successor and he furthers all that along. And part of what he does, first of all, like I said, they got 12 years of fighting, literally 12 years. This is the year that Antithemius ascends the throne. Okay. Leo does a lot to consolidate his, his easternness and then because of the fall of Valentinian and the Goths in the West, they're fighting the Goths. And then Antidamius is essentially a plant by Leo in order to restore the West. So coming up out of the prison, being locked up as it were underneath the Goths. Okay? I mean, see how many, the, the, the wit here and the sort of theoretical play on history is just phenomenal. And they're marking exactly, okay, from the fall of Valentinian, okay, which is the same year Rome was sacked and Attila was, had just died prior, or the actual sacking started in 454, I don't know which, I have to look it up. But that's the very year that Leo comes to power, all right, but it's late in 451, I mean 455, so he's a Kai here too. I didn't, I didn't make a Kai reference to Leo because I haven't looked up exactly what month he came into power because there was a little fight that went on in the Byzantines after Martian died. It wasn't automatic that it would have been him because he was like a general or a tribune or something under Martian but there were other contenders so this about to take place Leo was about in a sense because he was new alright at the end of the verse you got 467 and Antithemius who was crowned April 12th of 467. That could be considered 468 in John's accounting because the, the Jewish year turns new every March 21st or so. Alright, so this is about one month into the new sacred year on the Hebrew calendar. 
okay so we got the play of the two Kai's again all right Attila you could say well he's just a Kai also but he actually died in 454 so maybe he just is not he s but no team all right play with that if you want but our boy Valentinian the third really isn't anymore is not and there should be a new Kaiser as a result and there's actually a fighting that goes on amongst the Goths and at this point the Goths are taking over the Western Empire okay that's why there's 12 years of fighting by the newly appointed Leo in the East against the Goths and one of the guys he ends up fighting with and will end up killing him is one of his advisors named Rissimer. All right, Rissimer was a I think Rissimer was a goth. He might have been a vandal, but I think he was a goth. So he's using that because the goths were really big on being goths to sort of like hold at bay or finagle getting Antithemius in power. At first, he just wanted to take over Western Rome, but he couldn't pull that off. So now it's like, okay, well then I gotta appoint somebody, let me appoint somebody loyal to me who's married to my daughter. Actually, it's Anthemius, the son, who's married to Leo the first daughter. Anthemius himself is married to Martian, who's now dead. His daughter. Alright? So by marital alliances, which of course is all Revel uh, Daniel 11 stuff anyway. So you're seeing Daniel 11's prophecy, you know, reflected here too. All right. So is about to. Now that's really key because during that that black highlight, about to meaning it isn't yet. Yeah, they're about to. They're trying to be yet. They're still yet trying to be take over the Western Empire, but the Goths are fighting amongst each other for who controls the Western Empire, and they're also fighting against the Byzantine Empire, and all the sides are weak enough that that fighting goes on for quite a while. Alright? So all of them are seeking to what? Rise up from what? Whatever prison they think they're in. See how clever this is? Now, the next point about this is that the beast that isn't now is about to come back. So the warring that goes on during this period right here is paradigmal for history. The people want the beast so much that was, but is not. They're going to fight to get him back which is what Dr. Theodore's book was all about. And that fight's going on right now while I talk. That is the aim of the Russian Christians behind Putin. That is the aim of the American Christians behind Trump. And the Christians behind Trump and the Christians behind Putin are starting to make real nice with each other, thinking that they can create jointly a Christian nation. Of course, after that, then the Seven Mountains people in the U.S. versus the... the seven uh, third Rome people in uh, Russia they're all going to fight with each other but first they're jointly trying to bring back the beast Christians are trying to do this not the pagan not the unbeliever not the left okay about to so it is a recurring trend of history about to come up from whatever they consider their prison to be Physically, technically, this is referring to the period of 455 to 467, when finally Antithemius, Antithemius along with Rissimer, who's a goth, goth, manages to either do deals with or defeat the Goths that were warring with each other over Western Rome, manages to defeat them and they get in there instead. So this is an interregnum if we're talking about Roman emperors and there were puppet emperors that were put up by the Goths and they were all fighting with each other but from the standpoint of the way we look at things right or wrong it's an interregnum of 12 years 
okay? And also the, against the Vandals. Uh, you know, Goths, Vandals, Visigoths, there's a whole bunch of them that are kind of fighting during this time. Okay? Now, we got to get into a little bit more. So that's a trend of history that you can pretty easily see. But now we got to get into more about this other trend of history with the marital alliances. Leo was some kind of tribune himself, or I don't know, some guy in the army that Martian liked. But Martian, the, the, the thing after Martian was like, who should inherit after Martian dies? And it ends up being Leo. I want to say Martian had also a son. Okay, Martian had a son. All right. It wasn't just Antithemius. All right. It's it's some other kind of connection that I don't remember off the top of my head. But Leo was not actually part of the family. So what he seeks to do when he finally wins because the others are fighting themselves too much, so he ends up succeeding. And he starts marrying his family into Antithemius's family, and then sends Antithemius to be emperor in the West. But it takes 12 years for all that to occur. Okay? Now, at this point, Leo is sort of beleaguered. He spends the 12 years consolidating both his own rule amongst his enemies within and consolidating from the usurpers or, or um, attackers from without. So by the time this comes to 467, Leo himself, who is in other ways a, a capable ruler, he's sitting kind of pretty at this point. Alright? He's, he's won his goals. He's better off financially, although he spent an awful lot of money fighting those wars, than would have been expected, but a lot of that is because Martian left a treasury full when he died. So mo actually more than all the money that Martian left got used by Leo to do the fighting, but it made him win stability by 467, therefore appointing Antithemius. So now think about this. And is about to come up out of the abyss. So by the end of the verse, the abyss that the West was in is supposedly solved by Antithemius coming to the throne in the West. The prison that he was in in the east, not being able to do anything about it. The prison Western Rome was in, not being able to forestall the Goths or stop them when they were fighting with the Visigoths or the Vandals. Well, we got we got a savior now coming up out of the abyss. Now this is after Revelation 9, which is specifically about a time during the tribulation, when Satan specifically is going to do that. And yet here you see the reflection in the past, which is still future versus John, but is past relative to Revelation 9. So this tells you Satan's tactics. It also tells you how they'll turn out. Not good. Because your next phrase his end will be led away to destruction. This is destruction, Apollumi, Apollyon. You get the play that John is making on Revelation 9. Okay? And this is to lead away. This is famously used in Isaiah 53. Um, I want to say 53, 9. Okay? He was led away in silence. He didn't open his mouth. Alright, so now this is being led to destruction. Yeah, as soon as you come up out of your prison, you're just going into a new prison. But, you know, it's going to take nine years for that to occur. For Antithemius, it doesn't take that long. And for Leo, it doesn't take that long. But it does take that long for Western Rome, because the end of this verse is 476. You see how apt this, these phrases are? Okay? It's timed so that it ends at 476, which is the official Odovacar taking over, the official end of the Roman Empire. 
which is two years after Anthemius dies. Anthemius dies right here, in that clever, in the middle of Apolumi, which it means to destroy. Okay, like you destroy a building, it means it goes into ruins. It doesn't mean that destroy in the sense of no longer exists. It means that it's in pieces now. Okay, like Dresden after the bombing. Dresden still existed, but it was yet destroyed. You see the point? You got you got to make that distinction in scripture because Christ makes that distinction in Matthew twenty five forty one. Okay, and elsewhere, your soul being destroyed. That doesn't mean your soul seeks ceases to exist. It means it's in ruins. All right. So Antidamius's body is in ruins. So physically he dies. There. And then our boy Leo, who appointed him, physically dies here. And two years later, Rome physically dies at the end of Hupagi. You see the cleverness of this? Now one of the questions is going to come up, so I ought to address it at the moment. Because, well, brain out, you're breaking the clauses that way to get those results. Honey, I didn't know what the results were going to be when I did this. It's a rule that is somehow a rhetorical style in all the Bible writers from Genesis to Revelation to mark historical meaning. We call it historical. They would call it prophetical because it's before their time. At the end of a clause. So in order to find out what the Bible is benchmarking, I have to break it by clause. Now one of the features of Old Testament Hebrew, and I'm not sure why it's there, but if instead of breaking it by clause, you break it by verse, because the Masoretes marked out what was the end of the verse, what we call verses in the Old Testament are often just following the marking in the Hebrew that the Masoretes did. If you break it by verse rather than by clause in Old Testament meters, you you get meaningful things. So I don't know, and I would imagine that he did, I don't know that Moses, for example, broke down by clauses the Hebrew or any of the other writers. But they do break it down by verse. It does break every time meaningfully in history or for what they're saying by verse. This doesn't. This only works if you break it by clause. And uh, it, it's sort of subjective. Okay? And is about to go up out of the abyss. That's a clause. This is a prepositional phrase. It's not a clause by its own. A clause, the idea of a clause, is that it has verbal or it has a verb or verbal action plus a subject and an object. Okay? Now, if it's intransitive, it'll just have the object or just the subject. But generally speaking, those three things, even in any other language you want to talk about, a clause is a what they call, it's not really a good term for it, a complete thought. Well, a complete thought is defined as subject, verb, object in English. Okay, if it's intransitive, well, maybe you don't have an object. Okay? If it's transitive, maybe you only have the verb and the object. But it's a complete thought because you have action and either the subject doing the action or the object getting the action. So if you break it by clause in the Greek, and I've been doing this with all the chapters, then this kind of precision results. So when it happens like that over and over and over and over, then you realize you weren't being arbitrary to say, okay, I have to parse this verse by clause. You have to do it with all of them, all the time. And then you have to find out, okay, this is the year that's mentioned. Here it's 467 at the end. What's important about 467? And I guarantee you, when I did all this and I started breaking it by clause, I had no idea where it was going to go. None. Zero. I never do. When I do this meter, my whole objective is, okay, here's the rule on how to set up the meter, and then we count the syllables, and then we go look on the internet or through history some way to find out why is it this year that's benchmarked. 
So that's what you're seeing. I didn't orchestrate these clauses. I didn't write them. I didn't put the words in the order in which they are. All I did was tally them up. That's all this is. And then I'm like, well, 467, what happened then? I'm not a walking history book. I sound like one right now. But I'm not. I'm like everybody else. Okay. I have no idea what that means. And whatever idea I have, it's because I've heard it a thousand times from some yelling preacher. Oh, you're coming up out of the abyss, Satan, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know what it means. Oh, but now we do know what it means, don't we? So now when this trend repeats in history, then we can look back here and say, oh, okay, here's the paradigm for it. It's in the anaphoric center between 6 and the end of verse 8. Oh, so then you go look also to test that hypothesis, we'll call it, for repeats of attempts to raise the beast again in history and due to coming up and then the motive is to get out of prison. Well, every single time there's been a Rome revival, that's been its, that's been its ostensible moral reason for wanting it. Which that guy, Dr. Theodore's book, covered. You with me? Okay? So now, now we get in some more like, you know, history that happened then. They fought for 12 years at the end of 467. They finally went against the Goths enough where Anthemius gets to be in power in the West. He's a pretty decent ruler, considering what he had to work with. But he's underneath a fractious group. First of all, he's on the outsider, see, just like Martian was. And Thamus is an outsider. He's Greek. They're Latin. The Latin versus Greek thing is really big and strong by this point. So they don't particularly like him. But he's doing a pretty decent job considering what he's got to work with. Okay? Leo himself, too, is doing a pretty decent job considering what he's got to work with. But Leo has the same problem on Thamus has. The people under him, or his advisors, etc., they don't like him. Well, one of the reasons they don't like him is that he wasn't so hot on, I mean, he did do some of it, but he wasn't so hot on persecuting the Christians who didn't uh, subscribe to the Chalcedon Creed. Namely, the Monophysites, who were largely popular in the Middle, Middle East, over which Leo still has some suzerainty at that point. They don't like him being soft, as it were, on religion. And he really wasn't all that soft, but he was. Mo he, but his big goal was to get power over the clerics, and then and appoint his own people, and then sort of back off that because in his mind it's like, look, I got to fight these other wars. And Leo's thinking of uniting the Romes again, but he's not quite so religiously hung up as. Well, Martian really wasn't hung up either, but he helped foster it. This is the big breaking point. Breaking point with the East and the West. Breaking point with how you're going to, what religion role plays in politics. And it is at the same time a return to what the sons of Constantine all did, fighting over who's God. See? So we're starting to see a repeat trend going back to, backwards. To history. Well, what better text would explain this then? Well, the beast is not, and he's coming. What? Well, because people want him. And then when he comes again, he's just going to die again. And they mark that at the official end of the Roman Empire. So you got two guys who are pretty good at governing, considering what they got to work with. In the in the West here, Anthemius, and he's related to Leo's daughter. He's mar his, his son married Leo's daughter. And Leo. Okay? And then he, he himself, Anthemius, is married to Martian's daughter. So, when Anthemius has a son who he named Martian, marries Leo's daughter, I think her name was Leontia. Okay? Then they're tied by, you know, relation to each other. 
which is a Daniel 11 kind of thing. All right, marital alliances in order to foster a political alliance. Okay, well, uh, they were all about to come up out of the abyss, their own prison of not being able to control history too. And so by the end of it, they think, oh, we arrived now. We have come up out of our prison. Yeah, but you're just about to go into destruction. And the Kai here represents Ante Damius taking power at that point. All right, because he's a Kaiser, but he's really just a Kai. And he goes to destruction himself in the middle of the word for destruction. You get the wit. This God is saying, you guys, you thought you were one thing and, and you're not. It's God's disapproval showing. You. And then whoop. That's what's really funny because Greek preposition hoopo means to stand under. To be under. Okay? Hypostasis, one thing standing under another thing, one nature standing under another thing. Well, he's just playing who. He's just playing who. And who in Hebrew, of course, means he. Third person singular. See how clever all this is? If you were a Greek reader steeped in Bible, and you knew the Hebrew, therefore, you would see what I just showed you. And you still start laughing. So, when our boy Anthemius dies in 472, Anybody reading scripture would see that and go, oh, he's just a le now. Le. Okay. He's nobody. He's just a le. He's not even a Kai anymore. He's a le. In the middle of destruction. And our boy Leo in 474, he's just a whoop. Whoop. Who. Yeah. He's not even a hoop ball. He's just a who. All right, Hupage, of course, means to be led away, and both of them are led away to death. Rome herself is led away to death by the end of the clause, 476. And again, I want to stress this. It's a rule to parse by clauses. That's how the Bible writers do it. So if it lines up so perfectly with history, then that means God intended this, these clauses to have this result. But when you're parsing it, and that you'll go through the same thing if you parse any section of scripture. Parse it by clause. See what happens. Usually the meter is only used in, in prophecy passages. But it's also used to dateline a book. To say, hi, this is what I'm writing. But pick any passage of scripture you want and do this. Parse it by clause. See what happens. Here's what happens. Because it's a prophecy, of course. Timeline. Not all scripture is prophecy. And not all scripture offers timelines. Okay, so, and all the inhabitants of the earth wondered at the beast. See, the same clause. First, the Thaumasa is John himself wondering at the sight of the beast. Yeah, like, how could Christians kill Christians? He's being shown a vision of Christians killing Christians. And they're using politics to do it. And they're, they're whoring religion, of course, is a whore. To do it, and he's just a huh, huh, huh. Your mouth open, just staring at it. Okay, but now it's not. This verb is not covering John. This verb is covering all of the inhabitants of the earth. Hoy, the, but it ends up having a significance of all. Katoi kuntes epi tes. Case. And again, there should not be an accent mark at the end of that letter. So, and wondering, uh, this is Greek drama, okay? And wondering, instead of using a finite verb, they use a participle. And wondering, I think that's a participle, is that a participle? I get confused sometimes, let's see. Ah, indicative future active, I'm wrong, it's a finite verb. Okay. And they will be wondering. All the inhabitants of the earth will be staring and wondering at the beast. Before it's gone to destruction. After it's come up out of the abyss. Okay, so that's what happens here too. And I'll cover that in the next increment.